But okay. Okay, then looking forward to your talk, Sanjeev. It's over to you. All right. So, I'm uh, first of all, I should thank the organizers for um, inviting me to present my work here. It's a very nice meeting. And uh, uh, today actually feels more normal with all uh, four talks so far being in the offline mode. So, so far, I mean, there were always some online talks. Um, so, closer to normal, I would say. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, skirmions and anti ferromagnetic skirmions in metals and insulators. And I could as well, I mean, in the context of this meeting, the title could have been Magnetic Frustrations via Spin Orbit Coupling. So, the work that I'm going to present here today uh, is uh, uh, some part of uh, these publications by uh, you know, uh, us with two of my former PhD students. And uh, uh, Deepak, in fact, is also attending this meeting and he's going to give a talk on some aspects of this work in the next week, in the coming week. So, here is an outline of my talk. So, I'm going to, uh, you know, give a very brief introduction uh, to what skirmions and antiferromagnetic skirmions are and, you know, uh, how do we uh, observe them in experiments and why do we bother about them. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, we'll, I'll move on to trying to describe or explain uh, these, uh, these objects or these magnetization textures within uh, microscopic lattice Hamiltonians. And there, the model of choice that we will be looking at is a spin fermion model with Rashba spin orbit coupling. Uh, in, you can also kind of generalize it, but I'll be focusing in this presentation today about, uh, uh, about the role of Rashba coupling uh, in stabilizing skirmion like textures. And uh, I'll discuss aspects of uh, uh, such textures in, in metallic situations and insulating situations. That's sort of the theme of the talk today. So let's get started. So uh, what are skirmions? Well, I mean, uh, as we all know, probably that the story begins actually with Tony Skirm and uh, uh, in the context of particle physics, where skirmions were proposed as uh, models, uh, uh, the idea was proposed as sort of model for uh, nuclear particles. Uh, but what we are interested in today is uh, existence of such textures in the magnetization of certain uh, non centrosymmetric materials. And this was uh, kind of predicted in uh, 1989 and then uh, theoretically it was shown that such textures can indeed be uh, ground states uh, of uh, let's say uh, uh, some continuum models uh, in this paper in 2006. So what exactly are these objects? So um, here is a schematic view that you can very easily find on uh, you know Google images if you type skirmion. Um, so uh, one way to, so this is what is known as Neil skirmion and this is what is known as block skirmion. And to kind of relate these terms to uh, uh, Neil domain wall and block domain walls, uh, the one way of visualizing this is that you take a Neil domain wall. So this is like two ferromagnetic regions separated by a, a continuous tilt across those regions. And you join that straight domain wall uh, periodically in a circle and now take the inner region going to zero. So, take the inner radius to zero. That basically gives you a Niels skirmion. And you do the same thing with the, with the block domain wall, join it, take the inner radius to zero and that gives you a block skirmion. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, one can define for these objects uh, quantities like topological charge, polarity and so on. And in, in, you know, in terms of how these quantities are related to each other, you can call them skirmions or anti-skirmions. And uh, this can also be the topological aspect can also be shown with the help of stereographic projections where you show that this Neil skirmion, for example, can be wrapped exactly once on around a sphere. Okay, that sort of gives some sense to why this is a topological charge one object. So why do we bother about them? Well, so uh, of course, for theorists already the existence of such interesting magnetization textures is, uh, is uh, a reason enough to be, you know, interested in understanding these, these textures. Uh, however, there are more practical regions, reasons. So, this is, uh, uh, um, you know, one idea is this racetrack memory um, uh, where you can use skirmions as, uh, as, as bits in, in trying to, you know, uh, come up with, with, with new devices for memory storage and processing. And uh, um, if you look at this, uh, um, if you look at the, 
the key idea here is that one wants to drive these skirmions along this race track and uh, it, it is it is sort of it has been shown that you can, the skirmions can be driven by tiny electrical currents however there comes an associated issue which is about which is uh, which is uh, skirmion hall effect and the way it comes about is that if you if an electron is trying to run through a, a texture which is kind of twisting in space then the the coupling of this electronic moment to the um, uh, to the to the to the background magnetic moments is going to create a twist in the electronic spin uh, as well now if these background objects were pinned to a location then that's that's the story that is this electron will just twist around and and go across on the other hand if these background objects were also floating some kind then there will be a, there is going to be a reaction force and this reaction force leads to the sideways drift of skirmions and this is what is experimentally observed that uh, if you try to run such skirmions through a race track they would actually be drifted sideways so there are uh, you know efforts to try to cure this problem from the application point of view and one answer seems to be uh, given by these objects which are called anti ferromagnetic skirmions so these are uh, combinations of anti ferromagnets and skirmions so you think of um, in a linear combination of an anti ferromagnetic uh, texture with the with the skirmion and what you get is then uh, this object and uh, the way it helps with this skirmion hall effect is that now there are two uh, competing forces acting due to these two sub lattices and they actually cancel out and it turns out that such objects can be driven straight on a race track so in any case these are the practical aspects of studying uh, you know such objects now um, theoretically what one is interested interested in is of course understanding how these can uh, these can sort of arise um, but before that let's look at how they are observed in experiments and so i'll just briefly glance through the the key concepts that are used so here uh, this is basically spin polarized stm and if you polarize your uh, your your uh, stm tip in a certain direction then we know that the the tunneling current will be sensitive to the to the uh, magnetization of the surface and that way you can map out the magnetization textures on the surface that's one idea i mean of course it's very easy to say these things uh, as, as a concept but uh, there are a lot of technicalities involved in finally identifying what the magnetic textures on the surface were right so the other uh, way you can identify skirmions is through uh, lorentz uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy and that is exactly based on the lorentz force idea that you try to run electrons through thin films of materials which possibly have such complicated magnetic textures and then the the deviation of the electronic uh, beam is uh, kind of modeled back to uh, to figure out what the magnetic textures were and then of course you have the small angle neutron scattering so a combination of these methods can be used to identify the existence of skirmions in materials now coming to the theory so what are the theoretical approaches that one can um, one looks at in trying to understand skirmions so if you go back to the old days then uh, you basically write down the landau free energy functionals with certain gradient terms and then uh, you know these were the ideas that were used early on this the very first paper that i mentioned was in fact using this idea and uh, uh, but more recently there have been efforts in trying to motivate you know the uh, a microscopic origin of such functionals uh, starting with lattice models and this paper is a nice example of that then even more sort of recently now um, one has started looking into lattice models explicitly without going back to this coarse grained uh, landau free energy functionals one is trying to look at explicitly lattice models and these uh, these papers are kind of efforts in that direction and here if you look at this last one this is uh, probably the first effort where you try to retain the electronic kinetic energy in its quantum nature in the model while trying to describe skirmions and uh, this probably is important for certain materials where the skirmion size is very small and the actual uh, you know lattice of the of the system is uh, is relevant in terms of you know in, in trying to describe the size of the skirmion in fact some <clears throat> skirmions have been as i showed i think in one of the slides with this stm image sizes of some of the skirmions are like few nanometers and they in fact are also termed nano skirmions so there the lattice models become important because the structure is changing at the at the scale of uh, of few uh, lattice spacings 
So this brings me to the main topic of uh, my talk here, which is basically trying to understand this Hamiltonian. So we'll start with uh, um, a spin fermion model with a Rashba type spin orbit coupling. And this can be, if you look at the example materials which are showing this fermion formation, this can be easily motivated because many of these materials have all the basic ingredients that are contained here in this model, which is many of them are metals. Therefore, you should ideally worry about the electronic kinetic energy. Many of these materials, in fact, most of them have large local movements. So these are uh, the, the materials contain ions like manganese or iron or gadolinium. So the, the large magnetic moments are sitting there in the, in the uh, material. And then uh, either the, cent the, the uh, inversion symmetry is broken or there are uh, these thin film kind of structures which provide a natural sort of starting point for, uh, you know, arguing that there is a strong Rashpa coupling in this case, but you can argue there could be a Dresselhaus coupling or other kind of spin orbit couplings. So this, I, um, I'm looking at this as a generic model for possibly, you know, describing this Kermion physics. And if you look at this model now, there are two ingredients in this model. You have localized spins. In fact, I immediately add that I'm assuming uh, that these spins are classical. So there are two S symbols. The large S is a classical local spin and the small S is the electronic spin. And this is Hund's rule coupling of, uh, of these spins. And there are three kind of energy terms, electronic kinetic energy, Rashba spin orbit coupling, which is described by this term here, and Hund's coupling. And if you look at the Rashba coupling carefully, it is nothing but a spin flip hopping with a certain structure in the X and Y directions. So um, one question immediately is that how do we handle such Hamiltonians, which actually has a mixed degree of freedom. So it has a classical degree of freedom as well as quantum degree of freedom. And so what we, of course, commonly know is that if you have a pure quantum Hamiltonian, then we can try to, for example, for example, exactly diagonalize it. If you have a pure classical Hamiltonian, then we have had this very nice tutorial that you can treat this with classical Monte Carlo, for example, completely unbiased approach to understand ground states of classical uh, spin Hamiltonians. What do we do if we, we have such a Hamiltonian? Of course, you can say that I promote this large S to also quantum variable that becomes a quantum model and that's good, but that's bad as well because now your Hilbert space is uh, exponentially uh, you know, growing and you cannot do much with that Hamiltonian. So the fact that we took the classical approximation is actually going to be useful and the way it is going to be useful is you can use what is known as a hybrid Monte Carlo technique. So you already heard uh, this week about the classical Monte Carlo. So the only additional thing here in the hybrid Monte Carlo is because the electrons are sort of also are involved in the Hamiltonian, then the calculation of energy of a given classical configuration depends on the solution of that electronic problem. And therefore, if you have had a simple, uh, you know, Monte Carlo loop, then given a configuration SI, I would simply classically calculate its energy if you had a, if you had a classical Hamiltonian. And this is an order one process for short range models. But now we have to go via a fermion diagonalization. So you have to solve a, a fermionic problem with this given classical background. Of course, good part is that you can get away by solving a one electron fermionic problem because your Hamiltonian was uh, bilinear in electronic operators. Okay. So if you do that, you realize that you have a, um, a method which actually grows as order n to the power four. So order n coming from classical Monte Carlo and there is an n cube step sitting at every uh, update, Monte Carlo update step. So this is an N4 method. And with this N4 method, the trouble is that you cannot really handle very large sizes. And if you cannot handle very large sizes, then you cannot say anything about skirmions, which probably require a larger sort of scale to, for, for its treatment. So um, if you want to kind of stay with the, uh, this same spin fermion model, and then there are ideas such as the one proposed in this paper, which is known as traveling cluster approximation, where you basically say that when I'm trying to update a certain classical spin, I don't worry about the full electronic Hamiltonian, but I worry about an electronian, uh, electronic Hamiltonian on a small cluster constructed around that side. And then as you move your update site, this cluster also kind of moves around. Okay. This reduces the cost to n times nc cubed, where nc is the size of the cluster. And given a problem, one has to test how large a cluster is kind of uh, handling your, uh, your you know, uh, energy difference is reasonably well and then you can kind of uh, 
gain with respect to this exact order n to the power 4 in this case you can go maybe you know um, order of 10 site uh, 10 times more number of sites and so on in any case so this is one way of looking at such a hamiltonian and um, analyzing it without any further approximation so this this method is numerically exact much like classical monte carlo is numerically exact but of course then you have to deal with finite size effects and and stuff like that but this is not what we uh, do here so we go ahead and try to you know write or arrive at an effective spin hamiltonian starting from that that model and the way this is done is that you look at what happens in the large hund's coupling limit so uh, look at this term and ask what happens when this hund's coupling is very large so what you realize is that you can now rewrite your uh, electronic part of the hamiltonian in using uh, a rotated basis where at each site the spin of the electronic variable the electronic spin uh, is either parallel to the local spin or anti parallel to the local spin and if this coupling is very large then what will happen is that your your energy spectrum will split into two such bands which you can call a parallel band and anti parallel band and in fact this is very much similar to what happens in the hubbard physics when you split the two bands as lower hubbard band and upper hubbard band but this is coming through the hund's rule coupling and if you are now now there are two situations that are possible one is your fermi level is in the middle of this lower band or it is in this uh, in in the, in the in the gap okay these are two qualitatively different uh, situations so the physics of what if the level is in the middle of the upper band is completely same as the physics of what is happening in the in this case right so um, so if you look at now if the energy scale jh is very large then you can completely forget about that anti parallel band so you can restrict ourselves only to the parallel band so you have made your electrons spin less but their spin is carrying a complicated information because now this spin uh, uh, which is contained actually in this hopping parameter which is a complicated mess so now you only have a single band model spins the electrons have become essentially spinless however the cost that we are paying for this is that you have a variable hopping tight binding model so what happened to all the information about the background classical spins that information is encoded in these hopping parameters and that is essentially given by these formulae so the first term is coming from the normal hopping the second term is uh, the, the, these two terms are coming from the rashba coupling and you notice that because of the anisotropy of the rashba coupling in x and y direction you have to you know, kind of write two different expressions for the x and y direction where the expression for the uh, for the tight binding part the normal hopping is uniform along x and y direction so you can kind of uh, quickly check uh, so this is what is known as double exchange model if if you had no rashba coupling so you can call it a spin orbit generalized double exchange model so in the normal double exchange model if i had a, if i had a uh, situation like this where fermi level lies in the middle of this band how would i find my ground state the ground state is simply found by this rule so it is that particular spin configuration which maximizes this bandwidth because once you once once you have a, a maximum possible bandwidth then your energy which is basically the sum of levels up to the fermi level is going to be minimized okay and for the um, for the uh, normal double action model which has no spin orbit coupling that simply means that you have a ferromagnetic state so a ferromagnetic state is the one which will give you maximal hopping and that is the one which will then minimize the energy okay so that's simple enough now in this new model also the same rule applies because all so this is the entire model there is nothing more so same rule applies that is i need to maximize my bandwidth however because of these competing spin orbit couplings now a different kind of spin, spin configuration uh, uh, is going to maximize that bandwidth okay we can make this little bit formal by writing this uh, this hamiltonian here this modified tight binding hamiltonian uh, in this form where i now change this uh, uh, the complex hopping amplitude into a radial and uh, uh, exponent part right uh, angular part and then uh, i look at what what is the expression given by the radial part and it turns out that the radial part of this hamiltonian is written in this closed form 
So you have three kind of terms here. There is a term which is proportional to t square. There is a term which is proportional to t into lambda, lambda being spin orbit coupling. And there is a term which is proportional to lambda square. And the t square term is exactly the old double exchange term, which is basically a Heisenberg like interaction uh, with s dot s. Uh, so note that there is an overall square root in this Hamiltonian, which is which is there in the Heisenberg model. Uh, sorry, the double exchange model as well. The second term is like a DM term, Zelzinski Moria, right? So you have a, a gamma cap, a gamma prime cap rather. Gamma prime cap is defined this way, where gamma is the direction in the real space. So for the x direction, this is uh, y cap, and for y direction, it is minus x cap. So you have not only you have a Zelzinski Moria term, DM term, but you have a DM term with competing DM vectors on two directions. And then you know you stare at this third term. This has an isotropic part as well, but there is another piece sitting here. And if you look at it carefully, this is nothing but Kitayev term. So you have Ising-like interactions on two different directions. Okay. One component interacts along one direction, and the other component interacts along, along the other direction. So the model with just trash bar coupling and the double exchange uh, and, and the normal Hund's rule coupling included, that is modified double exchange model, is giving us uh, this interesting model, which has now uh, three different qualitatively different kind of terms. And they, they kind of uh, uh, are going to manifest themselves in terms of different magnetic states. And that's basically what we now uh, look at next. So having derived this, uh, effective classical spin model. Now we can do a classical Monte Carlo simulation of this, which is much easier and you can handle much larger system sizes. So now I'm going to uh, um, look at the results from classical Monte Carlo simulations on this effective spin model. So this is, uh, so look at this parameterization here. So I have, I had two parameters, T and lambda, the normal hopping and the spin orbit coupling. I have modified them into this one minus alpha and alpha combinations just to look at two extreme limits. Uh, so for all practical purposes, probably one never goes to uh, very large values of alpha. That's, uh, I think, uh, maybe there are no systems which belong to this right hand side of this. But for the academic purpose, we just sort of studied the entire uh, phase space. So now let's look at the evolution of, uh, of phases here. And uh, so how do we identify the phases? Well, we can calculate in classical Monte Carlo the, the spin structure factor. In fact, we can calculate component resolved spin structure factor, which is important because there are anisotropies. And then looking at uh, uh, the evolution of different components of this uh, structure factor, uh, you know, with temperature, we identify the nature of ground states. So at small alpha, you begin with the ferromagnet. Well, there's a little bit of a um, caveat here, which uh, one can discuss maybe later, not that. So the, the idea is this green phase will actually go all the way to zero if we had access to very, very large system sizes. If we carefully extrapolated our simulations to larger sizes, there will be no red at the zero of the temperature. It will be all of this green phase, but uh, let, let me come to that. So you begin with this ideally a ferromagnetic point at zero alpha, and then immediately uh, your structure factor grows into a tiny circle. And the radius of this circle increases. So we are starting over here. So I'm trying to describe just the ground state now through these pictures. These are spin structure factor plots. So I'm starting with uh, alpha equal to zero, which is my ferromagnet. And then as I move along the, the axis here, larger alpha, I get into these kind of phases, which are the points in the green region, which are termed classical spin liquid. Uh, and this is, this is the kind of picture that you were seeing in the previous talk, that you can have some phase space where, uh, so, so this, this is a reflection of the fact that there are many states which are having the same energy and there are no sharp peaks in the structure factor. So you have a diffuse ring pattern here in the structure factor and the radius of this grows and eventually uh, you begin to see certain anisotropies appearing. So you have arc like features along X and Y and then you have a simple single Q order. So there is still a double degeneracy. Either you can pick a single Q order along this axis or along that axis and eventually over here in this purple region you have a skirmion like phase where simultaneously there are four peaks in the structure factor. And then you have some more complicated phases, which I, uh, well, not that much important uh, for practical purposes, but interesting, uh, interesting looking textures. Right. So, uh, so what is the role of the, the interaction terms that I mentioned earlier? So 
the uh, maybe, maybe I'll come back to that later. Yeah. So let's let's look at the real space patterns of because we have done simulations, classical Monte Carlo simulations. The advantage we have is that we can really look at the snapshots of these simulations. So uh, ferromagnet, we all know what it would look like. So it's not plotted here. So I have plotted two examples from this ring-like thing. So one at small alpha, which has these filaments running around. And then uh, what you notice in going from this picture to that picture is that the filaments have become narrower. That's all that has happened. And because the system size is that, uh, uh, so if, if the filaments are much thicker, then they will be appearing like filling the entire space because you know you, you, do, you are simulating that larger size only. So the filaments will become thinner and then you will see a more detailed structure of what we are doing uh, in, the, in the lattice. And uh, um, uh, once you are in, in close to this phase, then you start getting the single Q patterns either along X direction, the stripe like phases along X or along Y. And finally, this multi Q uh, uh, structure factor uh, displays itself as, uh, as, as, uh, as I can call it as Kermion lattice. Uh, given that so this, in fact you look at the resemblance of this uh, this with the stm image that i showed you earlier so this was what is called a nano scale skirmion and this is exactly the kind of patterns that one can get uh, even in the absence of magnetic field in fact here yeah. now a little bit about so we were really interested in these filaments like why why exactly they're coming and so on so uh, so this is one slide about that so you can uh, firstly, the filaments appear when alpha is small, which means that I can ignore the lambda square term and it is the linear in lambda term that is relevant. So the linear in lambda term is the dm term with competing uh, anisotropic, competing you know, dm directions. And uh, uh, you can then make an ansatz that let's take a single Q spiral, simple spiral. So spin pattern is of this type. Uh, even when you define this, there are actually three variables in the problem. One is the plane in which the spins are spiraling. So this is denoted by the angle phi p, right? So when the spins decide to spiral in a certain way, they kind of define a plane. So they can spiral like this, they can spiral like this. So there is a plane that they spiral along and that plane can continuously rotate. So this phi p plane can rotate. The other variable is the, is the q vector of the spiral. And uh, one has to notice that that is an independent object. So the Q vector of the spiral can be written as a, as a magnitude times the angle, right? I mean, this polar decomposition. And now uh, we can kind of, uh, uh, the magnitude Q is not that important here. So it's the interplay of the beta and the phi P. So it turns out if you calculate energies using this variational ansatz, you find that you can pick any phi P, right? Then you will get an optimum beta for which the energy will be the lowest. And if you look at uh, different phi p's, these, uh, the, the lowest energies for different uh, optimum betas are exactly same. Only condition is that you have to satisfy this, you have to respect this. The beta minus phi p is pi. If you respect this condition, then every choice of phi p gives you another ground state, right? So there is an interesting degeneracy in the problem with, with respect to this rotation of the planes of spirals. And this, it is, it is this vision uh, uh, see which is manifesting itself in terms of these domains which are moving around continuously. So the idea is that the width of this texture is like the magnitude of Q. That is something that is decided by the magnitude of the spin orbit coupling that you have selected. But the orientation of these textures is completely free as long as you also simultaneously uh, uh, orient the plane in which the, the spins are spiraling. And this is what these textures do. So you have these domain walls which are moving around and then you have uh, uh, some kind of a continuous set of states which will give you the same energy. Now, uh, what happens to these domain-like structures when you apply an external, so this, this, so far this was in the absence of external field, but mostly we know that uh, when skirmions are observed in experiments, they are observed at finite magnetic fields. So what happens in this model if you apply an external magnetic field? So that is studied here and what we find is a one sequence, of course, for example, uh, this is the magnetic field axis. So if you start from somewhere here, low alpha, uh, you start with this filamentary domain structure as the ground state. And then uh, as on the application of magnetic field, the filaments start breaking and they start turning into skirmions. And then you get into some kind of a densely packed skirmion lattice. Uh, 
then as you, as you increase the magnetic field further, they become dilute and then they vanish into a saturated ferromagnet because of course the ferromagnet has to appear as a, you know, at some stage at large magnetic fields. One more interesting thing we found uh, was that uh, um, close to the ferromagnet, there are these sparse Kermion states which happen to be metastable as ground states. But for example, if we run one simulation where you start from low temperature with a ferromagnet at finite temperatures, the skirmions begin to appear. So this very, you know, narrow shaded region, narrow over here, this represents this metastable uh, states, which are actually uh, um, relevant for experiments because they will appear at finite temperatures due to the entropic uh, contribution. So this is sort of entropy uh, generated uh, skirmion phases. Okay, so since we're looking at the metallic situation, it's also interesting to ask what, how do electrons respond to, uh, to all of this? And uh, uh, so for this, uh, you know, so it's, it's of course well known that these skirmions will present themselves like an effective magnetic field, but this is just a nice example that we uh, tested it out. So you can create a skirmion lattice and then you put electrons in them, you can, you can kind of regenerate the Hall physics. So you have quantum Hall uh, effect visible with no applied magnetic field due to the presence of skirmions. And you can actually place yourself right, like, you know, right after this first peak. Uh, and you look at local density of states there, you'll find that there is exactly one state living on the edge. If you go to the move to the next, uh, next gap, then you'll find that there are two states living on the edge. So you can kind of very nicely see the quantum Hall physics setting in this uh, skirmion lattice. Okay, now uh, coming back to the next part, which is so far we discussed what happens when we have uh, our Fermi level is in the is in the band. Now what happens in the situation when the Fermi level is in the gap that is we are over here now. So the parallel band is completely filled. Yes. Right, so the density of electrons uh, essentially controls the, the coupling parameter of that effective Hamiltonian. Um, but much like in the double exchange model that uh, this coupling parameter is going to only change the, the, the transition temperatures. So it's, it's not going to affect the qualitative competition that is happening at, as a ground state competition. It's going to basically affect the temperatures at which these phases will become paramagnets. So in this case, the, so remember uh, the, in the earlier case, the idea was that the ground state is determined by going to a spin configuration, which maximizes the bandwidth of the, of this, uh, of these bands. Now that doesn't help here because that parallel band is completely filled. So independent of, you know, if, if I broaden it, it doesn't matter because I'm kind of filling uh, all the states. So, um, so then the, the lowest order contribution energetically that you get is coming from a second order perturbation theory, which is much like what you do for the Hubbard model. So you can take just two sites. Uh, and so here, instead of, uh, you know, um, uh, worrying about the Hubbard U being the separation in energy scale, it is the JH coupling that is the separation in the energy scale. And so just from the two site uh, structure, you can, so this is the sort of the same representation of the uh, second order perturbation theory uh, diagrammatically that you have a ground state has both the parallel sectors filled and then a virtual hopping takes place which fills one of the anti-parallel spins uh, on one of the sides and then there is a reverse process which brings you back to the ground state and in this process you gain basically this t square over u kind of uh, uh, energies. In this case of course the t square over u uh, is replaced by a t square over jh plus a, um, uh, this lambda ij by jh. So the, the spin orbit coupling also plays its role in contributing to this effective coupling. And very interestingly, the model that one arrives at here is essentially uh, closely related to the model that we saw earlier, the double exchange case. Uh, so the square root goes missing, first of all, and then you have an anti-ferromagnetic interaction term, a DM term, and the same structure with the k type term. The signs of interactions are all reversed. So it was ferromagnetic character, for this, for this exchange there, for the double exchange model, this becomes anti-ferromagnetic now and so on. 
So uh, one can expect that the physics of this model is also going to be very similar to what we saw earlier. So we simulate this particular model and uh, um, indeed um, it is true that the physics is similar except that here the starting point is the pi pi instead of zero zero and then one moves inwards. So you have this, this circular state that lived around zero, zero, zero earlier now lives around pi pi. And then you get into the various kermionic phases. In fact, I mean, I have not shown this detailed structure, uh, real space structure here, but these are anti-ferromagnetic skermions, the type that I was showing you earlier. So it's a combination of, um, of uh, an anti-ferromagnetic texture with the skermion-like texture. And so the story is very similar. So you go from a pi pi point, travel towards zero zero point, unlike the other case where you started from a zero zero point and travel towards uh, pi pi. Okay, so I think that brings me to the last slide. So the summary of the talk is that looking at the uh, combination of Rashba coupling with Huns rule coupling, uh, you can actually derive effective Hamiltonians for both metallic as well as insulating cases which have these interesting ingredients. So they have the isotropic exchange, they have DM interactions with competing DM vector directions, and they have Kitaev like uh, terms. And uh, the consequence of this is, uh, you know, a variety of uh, magnetic phases that appear. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, one aspect of this is uh, Deepak probably is going to cover in his talk, which is how to induce anti-ferromagnetic skermions in metals. This is not covered here. And I finally leave you with this picture. This is this is a simulation picture from our data, and these are these are experimental results: a zero field uh, scan and a finite field scan. So, with that, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev, for uh, telling us about the variety of magnetic textures that can arise in such models. Uh, we can now entertain some questions uh, from the participants here first. Yeah. So in the phase diagram you showed uh, which one? Uh, uh, the very first one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. this one. Mm -hmm. The phase diagram uh, in the third part uh, we have four uh, four parts and then we have moved to two points, right? In the fourth yeah, from one. here to this, right? And then again fourth. Right. It, why this happens actually? Yeah. So so he, oh, that's interesting. So actually, what is behind this is the fact that. Uh, the importance of the lambda square term is now coming into play. So when you are moving to these four points, now the Kitayu term, which is order lambda square, that becomes, so this, this evolution here from the circular pattern towards this is basically like a competition of the linear in lambda and the quadratic in lambda term. So that competition is what is leading to this change. Also in, I am not able to understand why we, to minimize energy, we have to increase the bandwidth. Oh, well, so that's, uh, uh, so it's like your total energy is the, is, is given by the energy of the, some of the energy of the occupied levels, right? See, I mean, the same argument you hear when you open the gap, that when you open the gap near the Fermi level, you push these states below and push the other states higher. Now, the higher states don't matter for us because they are not going to contribute to energy. Therefore, pushing these states below that helps in or that leads to the minimization of energy. Same, same principle applies here. But if you are filling both of these, then it would not help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you for this nice talk. Um, I, I have a question uh, about the phase diagram you show. So lambda usually um, cannot be really chosen. Um, once you have a material, you have lambda. So does your phase diagram imply that if we want to, um, if we want to find um, Examples. materials mm -hmm. um, with um, a, a given phase, mm -hmm. we should um, try to um, vary the bandwidth in materials? Um, uh, that's that's lambda. one way of looking at it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, so indeed that's what it is. In fact, so I think if you look at the, uh, I, in, I, we, I do not really claim that all of this can be realized in materials. Mostly the materials actually are living in, in this very narrow corner here with this alpha in fact less than 0.1. But uh, what, so what is going to be interesting is this, uh, this filamentary structure that what 
I term as classical spin liquid, this is going to be relevant for the material. So, in fact, in this like this example um, image from the experiment that I showed, they had this filament like structures at zero field and then they went into the skirmions at finite field. That is a more typical response in many materials. Uh, it is possible maybe that there is some narrow bandwidth material can have a, a possible realization of the other phases as well, but it is not very clear here. Uh, for the anti ferro uh, sorry, insulating case, since you have all these non-trivial textures and spin orbit coupling, have you also considered the possibility of exploring surface states? Uh, surface? I mean, it's like, it's an insulator, but with uh, oh. surface modes. Okay. Uh, that aspect we have not really looked at uh, yet. No, not really. No. Because it has that. so much... Uh, yes textures and I mean everything in it right there is a likelihood it may have something yeah. at the surface. So it has, it has a topological aspect of a different kind whether it translates into I mean uh, the so electronic really, states at the yeah, surface exactly. yes that's the question exactly uh, please go ahead Ludo. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. So, by the way, look, uh, your phase diagram in zero field, the purple region, that's the scheme on SKX, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, that, as you said, I mean, usually we expect the scheme on crystal to appear at finite uh, magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So, here, is it the additional term in your Hamiltonian that, uh, in because yes. I noticed the exchange term, then the Dreyer scheme, yeah, and then you have a third term? Exactly. So, it's, it's, it's this term, the order lambda square term, which is this K-type like, which is inducing that zero field uh, skirmion like texture precisely okay okay so if you look at uh, Hamil so if you if i ignore this term from the hamiltonian look at only these then i will get skirmions only at finite uh, temperatures okay. uh, finite fields yes and so you can you show again your phase diagram in in a field yeah in the field in, yeah yes okay and so the uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure you said it in a minute, PSK, so the green region. So it's, it's, a, it's a packed skirmion phase, uh, it uh, has this kind of, so, well, the corresponding structure factor is over here. Okay. So in fact, one difference between the, the zero field skirmion uh, that we get and this uh, finite field skirmion is the finite field skirmion is going to appear like the best packed structure in 2D, which is the honeycomb structure, hexagon structure, Bangalore lattice. Uh, zero field skirmion phase has this kind of a mm. structure factor which again relates to the fact that there is a ketayu term controlling it which has xx and yy and isotropy so that sort of is leading to uh, in fact there is a very interesting uh, idea that we uh, probably plan to work on is that you can kind of think of these phases so these filaments you can think of uh, a soft matter problem that relates to it so imagine these filaments being uh, flexible objects and you can actually figure out that the, the elasticity or the flexibility of these is related to how strong your alpha is. It's controlled by, uh, you know, how much is this lambda square term dominating in the, in the Hamiltonian. So when you go towards larger lambda, larger spin orbit coupling, these uh, textures become more and more rigid. So if I showed you some pictures at larger lambda, you will find that the filaments run only along horizontal and vertical lines. And this skirmion texture that we get at zero field is actually a set, sort of a roadmap of these, these guides. So you have filaments running along uh, X and Y, and then the crossing of these filaments exactly creates the skirmion centers for us. Okay, so in zero field, uh, it's also a sort of interference of these filaments. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Like the free queue. In the, okay. Precisely, precisely. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question related to the antiferromagnetic yeah. skirmions. I mean, for usual skirmions, if we cause grain, we have a so, I mean, the, 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 the spins, they make a sphere, S2. Yes, yes. And the question is what topological defect we may expect in, if we, I don't know the precise mathematical terms, when we map this sphere mm -hmm. to, onto the you know, two-dimensional mm -hmm. uh, toes or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the antiferromagnetism, uh, anti yeah. this is much more complicated because if you're right. cross-grain, yeah. like when we get the nonlinear sigma model, we have right. several terms. and. Right. Right. You expect uh, precisely the same type of topological defects, or you think there might be some complications or more interesting things happening? Mm. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't thought enough about that. So I, uh, yeah, mm. 
It's not clear. It's not clear. I think it will be more complicated. That's that's what my guess is, but I have not thought enough about that. Thanks for the question. Other questions from the participants here? Uh, online participants, do you have any questions or comments you would like to make? You can unmute yourself and ask. It doesn't seem to be the case, so then let's thank Sanjeev for a very nice talk. Thank you. And uh, 